It's always been my deepest wish to look inside my heroes' heads. What made them tick? Why did they do it? I've just returned from a descent into the deepest thoughts of this man, Luigi Maria D'Albertis. He's my hero of this episode, an Italian, but who penetrated in the 1870s the unknown interior of Papua New Guinea. Mind you, it was a terrifying journey to attempt, straight into genuine headhunting country. But he survived, and he returned to Italy with two heads, his own and this one, a young headhunting warrior. I was born in the wrong century. That's what my friends tell me, and I'm afraid they're right. I should have lived in the 19th century, when most of the world still had to be discovered. I should have been one of those brave men who left the safety and warmth of their homes to explore the blank areas on the globe, those places where no white man had ever set foot. Without those men, the world would not be as it is today. Without exception, all my heroes so far were obsessed. Obsessed with a mission for which they were willing to put all else in life aside. I often wondered what was going on inside their heads. I would have given a fortune to look inside the head of my hero of this episode, the Italian Luigi Maria d'Albertis. He was the craziest of them all. Nothing could stop him from penetrating into the dangerous heartland of Papua New Guinea. He traveled almost 600 miles into the interior and survived, thanks to a mixture of unorthodox weapons, like this one. Yes, opera to keep the headhunters at bay. But it worked. He returned to Italy not only with his own head still in place, he even brought back a second one, a head he chopped off the body of a slain headhunter. So I traveled all the way back to New Guinea and tried to find the family members of this man. But before that, I visited Italy to see if I could find this chopped off head and of course, to get an idea what was going on deep inside my crazy hero's head. <laughs> Here we are in the beautiful city of Genoa, where my hero, Luigi Maria D'Albertis, was born. And I'm a little jealous of him simply because he gave his travel books the very best title of any travel book. New Guinea, what I did and what I saw. Well, we know what he did. He cut off a cannibal's head and brought it back home. So my mission here in Genoa is clear. I have to go headhunting. I have to find out where the head is now. D'Albertis. Luigi Maria D'Albertis. 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 Okay. This ah. is Anna. Oh, She's a D'Albertis herself and the great grandniece of my hero. It is for sure one of the most remarkable members of the family. Yeah. Uh, he did something important. Um, bad character, but uh, good achievements. Like anybody, we have something good or something bad. Yeah. He had much bad. So Luigi had a much of bad. That doesn't surprise me if you chop off people's heads. I decide to ask straight away, 
Does Anna know where to find the head? Uh, the head was set in the, in the entrance hall in this house when he lived in Genoa. And it was frightening for the nephews that came to see him because yes. it was just in the, no, in the darkness. Uh, yes. and there was this jar with a, with a head inside. <laughs> and it was no, not a very pleasant sight. No, no. So Dalbertis kept the head in a glass jar. But where? To get closer to my hero, I have to find it. Anna agrees to help me in my search. The best place to start, she says, is with old Auntie Franca. <laughs> Auntie Franca isn't too eager to talk about her great granduncle, nor about his macabre trophy. Are we familiar with the fact that Luigi Dalbertis kept a snake as a pet? Ho paura, ho paura dei ragni, ho paura dei serpenti, ho paura di tutto. Auntie Franca's father kept a diary. In an entry for 1928, he mentions the head. Esiste però tuttora quella testa di selvaggio immersa dello spirito che figurava nella sala d'entrata dell'alloggio di Luigi a Genova e che per noi ragazzi incuteva un certo terrore. Di cotesso selvaggio, egli parla nel suo libro sulla Nuova Guinea, fu ucciso da un suo compagno della Lancia Neva per legittima difesa nella terza spedizione sul fiume Fly. La testa di questo selvaggio papuano, benissimo conservata a tutt'oggi nello spirito. Non ce n'è più. Even after a whole bottle of Campari, we are not getting any wiser here. No new facts in the diary. Auntie Franca advises us to go and visit the Dalbertis castle, towering over the city. That's the place where most of his personal belongings are kept. Plenty of things here from my hero. Guns, spears, diaries, books. Unfortunately, no head. But director Camilla de Palma knows a bit more. She tells me how, after a violent confrontation in the jungle, one of the warriors stayed behind, severely wounded. Luigi Maria decided that uh, probably it was a good uh, idea to, to cut his head off and, and, and bring it home, rather than leaving uh, in, uh, in the forest, <laughs> uh, surrounded by the jungle and by savage animals. Yes. Uh, I don't Do know you know, <laughs> have you any idea when, where's the head now? Museum deposits have always been considered repositories of treasures and mysteries. Yeah. So I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure it, is, uh, it, is, um, uh, it is back home in a safe place. Somewhere. Somewhere. Somewhere, yes, certainly, but that's too vague. At least now I know how he obtained the head, but, and I have to admit I'm becoming a bit obsessed here, where is it? It has to be here. It has to be somewhere in Italy. So I try one museum after another and become so impressed by the thousands of birds and insects he brought back. What a beauty. In my eagerness to find the head, I almost forget that Dalbertis was sent to New Guinea in the first place to search for unknown animals, like the mysterious birds of paradise. Well, it's difficult um, to imagine the treasures you have behind these ordinary <laughs> pieces of wood. Yes, yes. Crossing cannibal country was extremely dangerous. Collecting skulls was national sport number one in New Guinea. No wonder that Apart from birds and insects, Dalbertis found plenty of skulls. Mind you, skulls, not the complete head I am looking for. Most of the skulls he collected I find here in the Natural History Museum in Florence. They also keep a collection of special head hunting tools here. And more important, the curator, Monica Zavataro, knows how to use them. Queste sono speciali armi per acchiappa uomini, acchiappare ah. gli uomini. Uh. 
con questa eh, specie di mh, laccio di eh, canna di legno veniva messo al collo mentre la, la persona correva veniva acchiappato con questo e con il, eh, diciamo, il contraccolpo si infilava quella punta nella nuca proprio qui e questo, provo like sì. e questo provocava la morte immediata della, del nemico ora io mi chiedo come potevano tagliare una testa con questo che non è tagliente wow. That's the bamboo knife. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Yes. Now, and it's very um, common, of course, in the late 19th century, well, the whole of the 19th century, to collect skulls to place different tribes in different types, races. Yes. But this is something that Dalberti's brought back, it seems to me and, and everybody else, mm -hmm. uh, quite different. It's a whole head pickled in alcohol, just like all these other specimens. And it's, I can see, this is really quite a different order of collecting. Um, quite horrible, really. D have you any idea where this could be? Uh, we've no idea. We've been looking for it. <laughs> we don't know. Uh, no head where? here. Of course not. What do I expect? a 140 years old chopped off head hidden somewhere in a corner of an Italian museum. Maybe I should stop annoying you with my lugubrious fascination. But there is a reason for it. I'm named Reverend O'Hanlon after a famous freedom fighter for the Irish in Cromwell's time. Cromwell wanted O'Hanlon dead and put a price on his head. O'Hanlon's elder brother who was a bit short of cash, killed him and took the head to Cromwell's soldiers, who stuck it on a pole for everyone to see. Nobody has any idea what happened with the head after that. So now you know why I have this thing about heads. Enough, enough about me. Let's focus a bit on the rest of my hero's character. Yes, he was short-tempered, Violent, maybe, but with reason. When he was a child, his mother fled with a new lover, leaving him behind. He grew up as a wild and lonely child and later spent 10 years in solitude, hunting in the mountains of northern Italy. There was only one reason for him to come down to the city every now and then. One reason only, a weak spot. Opera. Luigi adored opera. They say he even succeeded in pacifying the headhunters in New Guinea by singing arias. How did he do it? What was his secret? I don't know anything about opera, but fortunately the leading tenor here invites me backstage for a bit of practice. La donna re mobile, qual piuma e vento, muta da cento. La donna è mobile, la donna è mobile, qual piuma e vento, muta da cento. As you can hear, I'm not exactly an opera star yet. But if I really want to understand how Luigi mesmerized the headhunters with his sweet voice, I have to make that one step and immerse myself in the art of singing. I have come here to suffer, and I'm afraid you're going to suffer too, because I just want to learn the merest snatch of an opera so that I could sing, say, Bellini when in New Guinea and impress the locals just as Luigi Maria d'Albertis did. 
So don't you dare say I didn't try. I never left that well prepared on a new trip. So finally, let's go. On my way to New Guinea. I have to make one short stopover here in Sydney, Australia. That's where Luigi started looking for money and a ship with a crew. In 1870, the brand new Museum of Natural History in Genoa selected Dalbertis as the perfect man to travel for them to the unknown interior of New Guinea. He started with a few expeditions, but then in 1876, 35 years old, Dalbertis decided to penetrate deep into the island by boat, following the Fly River. Here in Australia, people loved adventurers like Delbertis. They provided him with money and a small steamer, the Neva. With it came the first crew member, an Australian engineer. We know that Delbertis was controversial, but if you want to know how controversial, you should read the journals of someone who traveled with him almost all the way on his expedition and who loathed him his engineer, Lawrence Hargrave. I think if we come in here, Redmond. Wow. This will be a good place to view. And this is all Hargrave, is it? Yes, some of the most important archival material in the Powerhouse Museum. Wow. And Michael uh, Adams knows all about Lawrence Hargrave, the engineer who would steer the steam launch Neva up the impossible Fly River. Here in the Powerhouse Museum, they keep all the detailed diaries and the maps that Hargrave drew on the trip. This is the Fly River, and uh, they went, I think nobody had gone much further than here, ever, and they went right up to some islands up here. I don't believe they got this far. They yeah. couldn't have got this far in the Neva. Yeah. How did they do it? Why had nobody done it before? Well, there are probably three main things that come to mind. One is that headhunters, nobody knew yeah. if these people up the river were headhunters. I guess that's why he went so well armed. The other one, I think, was all the rubbish that was coming down the river. Oh, all the uh, trees, logs. Yeah, and, and trees and dangerous logs. Dangerous cataracts. That's right. Yes. And then, thirdly, I mean, every time it rained, you were, you were, it was like being, probably felt like being in the middle of the Niagara Falls. Just for this expedition, I mean, Hargrave is really far more obscure than Dalbertis because he has left no written record. Uh -huh. Aha, but he has. Uh -huh. And that's what we're going to have a look at next. Is that what's in here? Yes, his diaries and his journals. Shall oh, we have right. a look at Hargrave's day-to-day -day yeah, diary paints an unflattering portrait of my Italian hero. According to Hargrave, Dalbertis turned out to be a bully, violent, impatient, and unreasonable. Wow, look at that. Yes. Oh, that's magnificent with a seal on it. This is the first, this is actually his journal, not his diary. By the end, the two men hated each other. On Wednesday, July the 26th, 
He talks about um, whether he should chain him or kill him, him being Dalbertus. Whoa, killing Dalbertus. Co-traveller Hargrave didn't even try to hide his disgust for the Italian in his diary. According to him, my hero wasn't a hero at all. He was just a madman who killed natives at random, blew them to pieces with dynamite, singing arias in the meantime. Reverend, this is the, the definitive biography of Lawrence Hargrave. Uh, just take this one paragraph. Dalbertus had the callous habit of shooting at all who displeased him, of setting fire to their houses and blowing up their canoes. He laid a trail of blood where he travelled, improving on the dynamite idea by firing lethal rockets. The reverberation of explosion was a sound as typical of this flamboyant, Saracen-bearded, 35-year-old as the operatic arias to which he gave frequent, full-throated voice. In addition, he whipped his own men, starved them of their rations, and threatened them for the least of real or imagined misdemeanours. Wow, that's quite a condemnation, isn't it? It is. Maybe it all ended badly between Hargrave and Dalbertis, but then at the beginning of the expedition, everything looked bright, full of hope. In April 1876, Dalbertis, Hargrave and some crew members boarded the Neva for New Guinea, travelling to the mouth of the River Fly. I have no idea what to expect. When I tell my fellow passengers I'm heading for the Fly River area, they shake their heads in disbelief. The Fly River? Even for the Papuas themselves, that's still unknown territory. From the plain, it looks innocent, miles and miles of jungle. For thousands of years, warfare was the favorite pastime here. They chopped off heads to win prestige. The last time in the 1960s. I realized that probably every pensioner down there would be able to tell me how to do it. The plane drops me in Daru, a gloomy, sinister place. Not far from here, Dalberti started preparing his journey. The first thing he did was to hire the most respected headhunter of the area to guide him. Mino was his name, the proud collector of 33 skulls. Mino would prove to be of the greatest value. So Dalbertis had his Mino, but I, I've got Otherwise, Joe. I've brought Joe. Ah. Uh, he's, uh, he's the head of the uh, CID investigations. Wow. And uh, he's a strong man who can look after you. Yes. And he'll look after you here <laughs> in Daru. So he'll always be with you until the day when you will go back to... That's fantastic. Uh, he's about the strongest be. man I've ever said eyes on. Yeah, thank you. In the days to come, Joe will always be at my side. He takes his job seriously. As a modern-day warrior, he appears every morning in another battle suit, determined to protect us from whatever danger. <laughs> Joe is well respected in the area, like Mino was in his time. Since there is no such thing as written history in New Guinea, I realize I will have to search for oral history, stories told from father to son, from mother to daughter. Would there be stories like that about Mino? I asked Joe if he knows any family members of the famous headhunter. He just smiles and takes me to the harbor. So you're Mino's great-great-grandson? I am Mino's great-grandson. Uh, I well. welcome you. And uh, we are on our way to our village where my great-great-father was born. Well, that's pretty special because I think he was Dalbertis' only friend. Um, but here he is writing about him. I'll read this out to you. And you may not like this passage, but you're probably very familiar with his character. This is Mino. He considers men and women 
if they are strangers to him, good for nothing but to have their heads cut off. Up to the present time, his victims number 33. He's one hell of a guy, your relative. Yes. He becomes animated and excited at the idea of fighting. A warrior who bravely attacked him, or a woman sleeping in the forest, whom he could surprise and kill, would be to him exactly the same. He would see in each a trophy, a victory, and what he would esteem would be their skulls. He likes to see blood, a corpse with a head cut off. So he was the chief. He, yes. was the, he was the absolute, the most powerful man here. Yes. And you're his descendant. Yes. And 33 is one hell of a record. Yes. I'm quite familiar with what you have just read. Yes. That is exactly what he was. Yeah. And my father down the line, from him down the line, yes. uh, told us about his fame as such. Can we go and honor him, honor, honor your ancestor? Yes. yes. Uh, I'll be very happy if okay. we can do that. Let's go. Fantastic. Yes. For a moment, I do feel that childish excitement again, as always, when I walk in the footsteps of my hero. Here, Dalbertis walked, on this path with Bino, his proud guide. And this is the same road that he followed and used to use, and also uh, went into with his troops for head hunting. Yes. So this is the original road. Wow. Here in Mino's village, the people in 1876 had hardly ever seen a white man before. What a stir the hairy Italian must have caused. There was no way he could walk around here as unremarked as I do now. Once upon a time, it was just a path, small track. Okay, now after the raid, its men would come home uh, with his uh, heads of the number of people he killed. In a, in a bag or? No, in a, a cane, split the cane, yeah. and then hook them up for, through the mouth and out through the throat, and then would hang them and walk with it. Ah. And so each time they arrive at the man's house, uh, it would, its men would display how many he has killed. And that has a political impact on the status of- Of that the, warrior. Of the warrior. So, so warrior, Mino would have many more heads. Yes. yes. He definitely would have. It surprises me that nobody here seems to feel ashamed about their headhunting and man-eating forefathers. On the contrary, Bino's great-grandson is proud of his ancestor because he collected so many heads. If you asked an Italian if he knew Dalbertis and the answer was yes, it would probably be because he read his book what I did and what I saw. Here, it is different. Most of the men know the story of Mino by heart, although it is nowhere to be found in print. The villagers just heard it thousands of times, repeated by the elders. So, At the beach, Joe tries to convince me it's all due to the betel nut. Chewing the local drug, he says, stimulates you and sharpens your memory. With his wonderful red smile, he offers to teach me how to enjoy it. It's quite a complicated process. Three things, the betel nut, the mustard, and the lime mix up. Hmm. You do it like this. I need this inside. It's my habit always to try the local drugs, but this time, I regret it immediately. Like this, okay? And then you bite it and then you, you mix it inside with your tongue, inside. Mm. <laughs> inside. Ah, see, mine is more red than yours. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna be very, very ill. <laughs> Don't chew beetle up. Somewhere on this beach 140 years ago, the famous headhunter Mino boarded Dalbertis' steam launch. And what's more, the villagers still know about it. 
It's this oral history tradition that will keep surprising me in the days to come. Everywhere along the Fly River, people tell me stories about the arrival of the Neva as if it happened yesterday. And that means I can give in to my obsession again. The head. The head Dalbertis took with him to Italy. Where did he harvest it? What tribe? What part of the country? It is Joe again who comes up with a plan. To find the tribe, he says, we have to focus on the hairstyle. You look wonderful. Could I, could I possibly take your picture? Oh, yeah? Thanks, thanks very much. Yes? I, I mean, is that, is that OK? Could you look that way? So, yeah. So, so, that's wonderful. Yeah, I think that's good. <laughs> yeah, this is really good. Excuse me, could, could I possibly take your picture? That's it. Fantastic. It's beautiful. Thank you very, very much. This one, this one is natural. Yeah, it's naturally grown. Yeah, that doesn't work. The hairdo of my warrior's head on the picture has nothing to do with the fashionable Rasta outfit of these men. But they all know one thing for certain. Hair like this was a typical characteristic of the feared Boatsi tribe, a warrior group that lives further upstream on the Fly River. So that's where we should go. But before going there, I have to prepare myself thoroughly at least as well as Dalbertis did in his time. You'll never guess what I've got in this trolley. You're in for a big surprise. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Don Giovanni. That night, I can't sleep. Once more, I put all my information together. Dalbertis described how a member of his crew, a certain Bob, killed one of the natives after a fight. Dalbertis then couldn't resist the temptation and ordered Bob to cut off the head in order to take it back home to Italy. But where did this happen? Upriver with the so-called Boazzi tribe? And how would they react there if I show them the picture? I close my eyes in an idle attempt to enjoy my probable last night of sleep in a decent bed. Day by day, Dalbertis entered a dark and mysterious world. The Fly River may look friendly from the sky, but Hargrave, his Australian engineer, needed all his skills to keep the Neva on track. The small launch was heavily overcrowded. Apart from the vigilant Mino, Dalbertis had recruited a crew of Chinese, Jamaicans, and even a man from Fiji. They had no idea what to expect. The river, was a danger, but a much bigger threat was hidden on the banks. They knew that behind those trees, people were living. Primitive people, warriors, who had no idea that civilization was on its way upriver. To understand the fly, I have to go by launch, like Dalbertis did. I want to feel the suffocating heat and sink barefoot into the swampy mud, sucked by leeches and mosquitoes. Thank you! But most of all, I want to meet the offspring of the warriors who then, in 1877, saw Dalbertis coming. 
Now imagine you've just seen a white-bellied sea eagle, which I have, but it was unfortunately just carrying a frog, but uh, that's really filling your mind. And you don't notice that you're coming up to a point like this, uh, which is hidden. Behind it, you don't know, but there can be, what, nine, ten huge war canoes, specially made for fighting. And they're just waiting, and you don't know. Uh, Delbertis was a brave man. He would give out, he seemed to have an endless supply of bales of red cloth and, um, as it were, jars of peanut butter and uh, sugar and um, he, he, he had all these gifts. And these kind of people, they threw the gifts aside. It wasn't the gift they wanted. They wanted something more personal. They wanted really all he had to give. I'm amazed he survived and his head was so desirable, that massive beard. It's a beard big enough for you could, you could have a whole swarm of bees in it. From day one, the Neva was attacked by warriors. Luigi describes it in detail. Horrifying stories of lethal spears and arrows shot by painted men hidden in the bushes, missing his head by inches. It must have been a nightmare. But how do the villagers on the riverbanks look at it from their point of view? Is there any eyewitness account left? I'm lucky to run into Robin, whose grandfather told him when he was a little boy about the white men coming upriver. And Robin wants to take me back in time. How I know it, I was told by my great-grandfather named uh, Bear. Yeah that the first white man ever came and explored this river was a white man. They said, we don't know his name, but he anchored right here. Uh -huh. yeah. And then I asked him, how did you respond to it? Oh, we thought it was a big turtle. <laughs> because he came in a big boat. Yes. We thought the boat was a turtle. Uh. But we did not see, we didn't see any boat inside the boat until we tried to track the boat and then a white man coming out of the boat, uh. out of that turtle. Yes. Now, that was a story that was told. This is where the sort of whirlpool is. So the, the boat was anchored here. And the people were camping out here in this bush. There, there was a hamlet up in there. Ah, right uh, there. Uh, without him knowing that people are living there. So they're trying to bring the boat inside so that uh, they wanted to attack the boat. Some of them came down the hill, come down this way. So when he found out that, uh, yeah, there's, war, there's people there, I think they're trying to do something bad to them. So he fired. Can't fight. Flair. The short-tempered Dalbertis was no diplomat. He didn't hesitate to send flares and rockets into the bush to teach those savages some manners. But he fired his shots again up there because they went down, they walked up there and then, because they were all naked, they went and did this to him. That's me. We're turning back a little bit, taking off. It's an insult. <laughs> it is. I fire a rocket. Yeah. So in, in our tradition, that means they're cannibalized, eh? cannibalism. Uh, so we will kill you, we'll eat you, uh, and we'll excrete you. That's what it means. But luck, lucky, lucky, he understood. And, and your grandfather sounds yeah. like a wonderful man. Did he, did he ever know the name? Did, did, did... No, he never knew the name. No. He only said a white man. Uh. He came out from the turtle. Yeah. But later I went to school yes. and found out that the person who came here, yes. and his name is Debatis. And what did your grandfather say? Oh, what? What is his name? I said, Debatis. Yeah. Debatis is the white man that first came to this place, and that's when our people saw oh. him. Unfortunately, each first contact between Dalbertis and the Stone Age ended in misunderstanding. My hero got fed up with all the delay, he came here to collect birds and insects for his museum, not to blow naked warriors to pieces. It's somewhere here that his engineer Hargrave started to dislike the leader, as he called the Italian. Hargrave feared that the locals, for years to come, would hate every white man approaching their village. But traveling further north, I realized that Dalbertis' strong reaction probably saved his life 
together with Hargraves and the rest of the crew. Hi, Reverend O'Handler. Hi. Michael Yan? Ah, well, I've no idea where I am, so I'm yeah. very lucky to meet you. Yeah. This Thank was you. no this innocent was paradise, paradise, as most people in Europe thought. These primitive men weren't exactly hankering after peace. One of the villagers, Michael, makes that perfectly clear to me. So do you think it was your people who attacked Albertis? <laughs> yeah, it is our people who attacked yes. the Albertis. What do they think of this um, white man? There was no, no, no legend about a white man, and yeah. maybe our great-great-parents thought we, we, we were only the black people. Yes. But without knowing a white man. Yeah. And it was a surprise to see a white man, a human being like a, a black man. Yeah. And, but then the belief uh, normally was that uh, after a person dies being a black man, he becomes a white man. Yes, and white spirit. Uh, yeah, somewhere. white spirit. And yeah. our great-great-parents still wanted the head. Yeah. And first time seeing a white man. Yeah, because, you want that head. Yeah, because they were cannibals, they were eating uh, human flesh, and uh. they wanted to eat a white man. Maybe yes. they have already tasted uh, a black man's meat, but they, they also want to taste a... The meat of a, a white man uh, might be really good. White, yeah, so, maybe yes. it could be more delicious <laughs> than a, a black man's yes. flesh. That makes sense, a change of diet. My admiration for Dalbertis only increases after this. He had to be very creative to survive these hungry people. So guns, yes, flares, why not? But he had that other, completely unexpected secret weapon. You know what I mean, from Italy with love. Con the aria singing was one of his more peaceful weapons. Dalbertis describes how some of the tribes loved it. They assembled around him and while holding their breath, listened, quiet as mice. And if at the end neither guns nor opera helped them to relax, he could always rely on his chemistry set. I took out of my pocket a vial containing pure alcohol, and having poured it into a shell, which I borrowed from the natives, set it on fire. This feat led them to take me for a magician who by some means or other had been able to set water on fire. For who in their country had ever heard of water burning like fire? I went down to the edge of the sea, followed by the natives. I took a match, lighted it, and made as if I were going to set fire to the sea, as I had done to the water in the fire. The poor, simple natives were terrified and conjured me not to do this. I graciously consented and extinguished the match. They then explained that if I had burned the sea, they would not have been able to return to their houses, that all the fish would have been killed and they would have had nothing to eat. And word got around. Here was a man who could set water on fire. You didn't really want to attack him. The brave warriors along the Fly River would soon find out they'd better not mess around with this white-skinned European sorcerer. One day, Dalbertis was angry because his belongings were stolen. He told the village chiefs that God would punish them if they didn't bring it all back. They laughed at him sitting on their meeting place, a pile of stones on a small hilltop. They didn't know that Dalbertis had mined their meeting place with dynamite. He asked them to withdraw for a moment and watch the place where they'd been sitting. Unobserved, he lit the fuse. <coughs> it is needless to describe their terror. Their limbs, far from enabling them to fly, could hardly support them, and they were barely able to implore me to have pity on them, promising to restore everything. When their fears had somewhat abated, 
I took them to see the effect of the mine. The stone had vanished, and its place was occupied by a hole. <laughs> Wonderful. We're almost halfway on the trip of Dalbertis. The bad food in combination with the heat and the constant attacks of the villagers brought the explorers to the edge of exhaustion. The crew members start to mutiny and fight amongst each other. Dalbertis himself was feverish. He suffered from dropsy and could hardly move his legs. On top of that, they were now entering the region belonging to the fierce Boatsi tribe. Well, here, I'm in the village of Wanga Wanga, and as you know, the first thing you must always do in a strange village is to try and find the chief to get his permission for what you want to do and, if possible, his blessing, and then you'll be fine. Hi, you must be Richard, the chief, yeah? Ah, so look, go uh, down now. Yeah. Let me show you I've got something here. Somewhere here, my opera singing explorer must have collected the head he photographed for his book, What I Saw and What I Did. Time to start asking around again. Carefully, of course. I made a member of the meeting. Those are the family members. Were you there? Yeah. Could we, could we go and show them? Yeah. Yeah? Oh, Suddenly, in this village of Wanga Wanga, we are getting close. The man in the yellow shorts seems to know more. He almost snatched the picture out of my hands and shows it to some relatives. The photograph of the head is causing a stir. Yes, that hairdo is indeed the hairdo of their ancestors. They don't hesitate one moment. This guy had to be one of them. The rest of the day, the story of the picture echoes through the village. I suddenly realize the impossible might come true. Maybe we can find the tribe that the beheaded warrior belonged to. Maybe, maybe, maybe the man from the picture came from this village. And maybe we can find someone who might know why he was beheaded. There's too many maybes here. One has to know for sure. The only one who might know all the answers seems to be an old chief, Edmund. But unfortunately, Chief Edmund is not here. He will probably be back in a few days. Probably, maybe. We have no choice but to wait. To wait a few days, a few nights, for Chief Edmund to return and take a look at the picture. Die dag erop komt Chief Edmund inderdaad terug. De aanblik van de foto brengt een golf van emoties teweeg... waarbij de werkelijkheid nog schokkender blijkt dan tevoren in Italië gedacht. Heel Wanga Wanga bemoeit zich ermee. En in het dorpshuis lijkt 1876 nog maar een paar weken geleden. O'Hennen zelf doet dagenlang nauwelijks zijn oog meer dicht. Afgehakte hoofd achtervolgt hem in eindeloos terugkerende nachtmerries... waarbij vergeleken Don Giovanni's avonturen onschuldige sprookjes blijken te zijn. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you liked it. If so, you can watch the next episode here. Or check another recommended series on our channel. And don't forget to subscribe to get updates on new series.